Okay, we're gonna pick up uh, from the fire drill. We were just going on a fire drill. We talked about fines, we talked about uh, excessive bail and cruel and unusual punishment. And that's the main takeaway from, I'd say the whole chapter, everything about punishment and sentencing focuses around cruel and unusual and excessive bail and fines. Keep it fair, keep it real. Bless you. Okay, Spring Cartel, concept of cruelty is changing, reflecting contemporary standards. Uh, there has been an explosion of Eighth Amendment jurisprudence in recent decades, that's true. Explode, reflecting contemporary standards. I was in Athens, Texas, taking a class on how to maintain your RV. 40 hours, it was wonderful. Talking to a Marine. Lost, uh, he's an amputee, lost a leg. And we're just talking about life and things. And it came up uh, about boot camp. And I told them that the Department of uh, Corrections at Gulf has completely revamped the, uh, their training there, the academy. It was a live-in academy. You had to earn the right to get liberty on Wednesday nights. You get three or four hours if you behave. And you had to earn the right to go home on the weekends. You went home maybe one weekend a month if you were lucky. That changed. Students were complaining. It's ran like a paramilitary and it ain't right. They hurt your feelings when they yell at you. Okay. He told me about the military. He goes, would you believe? And this is boot camp. They give the soldiers, he said, I think it was a yellow card. Actually, you know what I mean? A yellow card. When you're in boot camp, and if the. Uh, you mean like a stress free, stress free card? No. Stress free card? Yeah. Okay. A stress free card. And if the drill sergeant hurt your feelings, or you believe your feelings, you give him a card. Right. <laughs> yeah, I missed that opportunity. Isn't that funny? You, you missed it? Good. I, I thought he was kidding. I came home and talked to my son. He goes, oh yeah, he goes, they give him a card. And they get their feelings hurt, they just hand them a card. Yeah. <laughs> Get their phone back. And then what happens? I don't know. I was in shock. They get their yellow card, they get their phone back, they have a seat, and they have a snack, and they have a snack, and they get patted on the back. back. Seriously? Yeah. 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 That sucks. Yeah. That's how your military So that's yeah. how the kids yeah. you can do something Yes. Absolutely. Just remember, yeah, make a joke of it now. But if you're there, if somebody hurts your feelings, I'll give them a little card. That is our contemporary standards of decency. There's no losers, right? Everybody wins, we're all winners. I like the T-ball game. Huh? I like the T-ball game. That's where I was going with it. Yeah, the, the soccer, we don't keep score. Everybody's a winner. How do you know who wins? There are no winners. Just no losers. Are you kidding me? I could not be a coach for these kids. If our judicial system is a reflection of contemporary standards. Oh my goodness. Officers are gonna have to ask for permission before they use a baton. <laughs> Excuse me, but I'm going my side handle baton. Whatever. I'm about to execute a forward strike to your shoulder. <laughs> Do you mind? Yeah. See, you have a knife and I have a taser. I'm going to apply this to your- Well, you're gonna have to talk about that. <laughs> I don't know where it's going, okay? I will acknowledge that there is abuse. Okay, there has been abuse. It's well documented. But it's a small percentage of officers that are abusing their authority. The majority of most officers I don't ever want to hurt anybody. But sometimes you're not left with that option. When are you going to the simulator? Monday, you said? Oh, no, we already went Monday. Oh, you already? Week we went. We have a use of force simulator on the Medica campus in the 3000 building. We have the, the vehicle, the squad car there, and it takes two to control both the simulator and the car. But we have two operators usually. Did Bart Armfield by himself? Uh, uh, no. Who ran it? Uh, I think it was, it was one of those girls, girls are in the TV, and then one girl is doing like the computer. Well, that, was it a student or a person? It was, a, it was his, one of his workers. One of his 
she was yeah, she's from the Explorer program. Okay. And so she was doing the car and the oh, car good was for doing her. And he was doing the use of force? Yeah. It usually takes two to operate it right. We put you in the car, we give you the scenario, you're dispatched to a specific location. You get there. And while you're driving, we could also throw certain elements into the scenario to so keep right. you on your toes. Well, it could be programmed, but you could also make changes on the fly. That's why it's pretty handy. Yeah. So you get to your crime scene or your call where you're supposed to respond, and you have to evaluate the incident. You're armed, you have a taser, they're hoping you have a taser. You have a, a Glock, a taser, and a pepper spray. And the pepper, no baton? Uh, no. no. We have them. So anyway, you're armed, you respond, and you have to assess the situation. What are you gonna do, if anything? Hopefully you can use your dialogue, communicate with someone, de-escalate and control. Okay, that's ideal. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. It'll go sideways on you. Okay. Now you have to decide, is there a significant threat to your life, to your health? If there is, what are you gonna do to stop that threat? Uh, you ended up using a firearm, right? Uh, yeah, pull the knife on me. So the suspect pulled the knife, Felt threatened, ended up shooting him how many? Four? Four times. Four times. Did three out of four. And he wants three for effect. Not bad. Is there a rule how many times you're supposed to shoot a suspect? No. That actually depends. Well, until they, until they were basically dead. Well, like, not dead, but you've uh, stopped. Yeah, once they're on the ground. Once you stop the threat, that's what you have to handle. Yeah, I saw a video of a guy trying to shoot up a police station, mm -hmm. but his. Um, was that he couldn't put it on, so a police officer shot him like 17 times. Is that allowed? Or yeah, well, there was like five cops too that were there. I, I know what you're talking about. There was like five cops that all shot at him, so uh, I'm not surprised. That's an overkill. Uh, but remember, guys, and I'm not trying to defend, I'm not going to say that was right or wrong. When you're called into a situation like that, and there's somebody there with a real threat, and they have a life on the intent that as soon as they get this bag in, they're coming after you. And if there's multiple officers, Every one of them, uh, forget what it's, uh, there's a name for it, not trigger finger, but your adrenaline's pumped up. Sure. And you just start pulling the trigger. And it's more of a rapid fire. And you don't do it consciously, it's more subconsciously. So if every officer's doing that, they're all pulling that trigger until you stop that threat. Yeah, you might get hit multiple times. But there's one way to avoid that. Shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be there. <laughs> with a freaking up firearm trying to shoot up a police station. That's not good. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Today, inmates enjoy protections never seen by the framers of the Constitution. That's damn right. Uh, the right, medical care, minimum amount of space, exercise, physical activity, diets, legal materials, and there's a lot more. Visitation, a mail, there's a bunch of different things that the state of California through legislature and the Constitution through the Supreme Court in their decision have regulated how a prison should operate. Healthcare is the one thing that still gets under my skin. And I'll tell you what, if any of you are sick, okay, and you got the best healthcare, you got the best plan, call your doctor and make an appointment. Are you getting in the next day? No. How long? Like two weeks. Three weeks a month, if you're lucky. And you're lucky if you see a doc. You might just see a nurse or a PA, but you're happy to get it. By court ruling, uh, I think it was Cahia, or soon after the Cahia decision, came down, the state, any prison, any detention, if an inmate, a incarcerated person, it's a sick, sick call ticket, they write up a ticket, they say what the problem is, they hand it to the officer. By the time they hand this to the cop, the clock starts, 24 hours for this person to be in front of a doctor. Not a PA, not a nurse, a doctor. Who's holiday and weekends, they don't care. How the hell is that okay? They're getting better health care than we are on the street. The uh, diet, is one of our diet, yeah, healthy diet, we, every prison hires a nutritionist that develop the meal and they have to make sure it's well balanced. They get two hot meals and a sack lunch. It was three hot meals. 
spent more time feeding and never got anything done. So they went to two hot meals and a sack lunch, they picked up that food. But if I'm, oh, <laughs> I'm of a specific faith that says I can only eat a, a certain type of a diet, the state has to provide that diet. And that's where your tax money is going. Uh, minimum states, we used to double sell. And this one I kind of agree. In San Quentin, the sales are a little more narrow than this desk. Okay, now maybe a little bit. If I could put my hands out, we'd probably go about this way. Okay, so a little bit more narrow. They're a little deep, maybe from about here to the window. Maybe a little shorter than that, but narrow. Two bunks on one side, and they're both fixed. A uh, toilet in the back, a sink, and some shelves. That's a typical cell. Two men, two people per cell. They get pretty uncomfortable in there. I think they really do. So I kind of see that. Our population, living population, has gone down for quite a while. At work, my prison where I was at, I had about 1,150 inmates on my yard. There's one yard. There's four of them plus level one outside. 1,150. Last time I was there, they had an all single cell. They didn't have the gym, or they called it a dorm, and we were housing inmates in the dorm. We had inmates, we called it Broadway. They were out on the floor inside the housing units because we didn't have room. Now that population went from 1,150 down to between 350 and 410 per yard. About 60 something percent reduction in the inmate population. That's huge. Because of that, uh, the bill, it, it wants to say it's 109, where they reclass what a felony is. They put those state inmates back into the county. So instead of the state, or excuse me, the county sending them to the state to do time, because remember, county can only house uh, an offender one year. So anything less than a year, they could keep them. Now, they can keep lifers there if they want. As long as they don't pose, uh, they're not violent. A violent risk, they're not uh, sexual predators. There's certain criteria. But good behavior? Good behavior? Basically. Behavior, yeah, it's all based on behavior. Uh, so if these guys are decent people, and they just want to do their time in their own county, they can. And then what's because LA and San Diego County never would build a prison. They're all in the central town or up in the mountains. So pretty much they were absorbing all the unwanted. So the state got smart and said, no. You want to lock them up, you keep them. Yeah. Uh, for the medical care, what would happen if they didn't get that uh, care in 24 They file an appeal and the warden gets out. Not the officers, not the lieutenants, the warden. You know what happens if the warden gets a slap on the wrist? And it's because I did something wrong? I'll be on graveyard the rest of my life. That's crazy. What's that saying shit rolls down the hill? Yeah. You don't want, but they hold the world. Wardens are counted. And they they just don't let it happen. Uh, judges, most jurisdictions, more leeway in sentencing. This, I always think of the criminal justice system, it's a pendulum, okay? We were way over here, 60s, 70s, and 80s, where the judges, the courts, the prisons, they ran the criminal justice system. Because of uh, lawsuits, appeals, and other decisions, the pendulum kind of came back towards the middle, kind of where it should be. But then the attorney saw an opportunity to make a lot of money by suing the state. Now the pendulum's way over here, where the tail's wagging the dog. Okay, the inmates are dictating policy, and that's bull, through their attorneys, right, through their attorneys. But that's all right. It's on its way back down. Okay, the pendulum's coming back down, not because the state realized that corrections and everybody else has done a good job, the reason it's coming back down is the state's broke. <laughs> the attorneys ain't taking cases because there's no money to be made. So it's coming back down and hopefully it'll land somewhere where we get fair justice all the way across. Most states switch from intermediate sentencing to determinate sentencing. Uh, and that's the 
what I was telling you about, where the board of prison terms used to determine release dates. When this offender would be released, that was the indeterminate, right? Because the board controlled the release date. To determine it, the legislature telling everybody, you can only keep this person two, three, or four years, four years max. You cannot keep this guy, no matter how ruthless, what a criminal person this guy is. He did his time, he's gone. You cannot keep him. He has to reoffend. Get a new case, then we lock him up again. Terrible, terrible. Uh, determining sentencing jurisdiction, judges have little leeway in imposing. That's because of determinate sentencing. Somebody else already did the work for the judge, and all he's doing is reading from the script. Uh, growth and determinate sentencing scheme perceived need to ensure fundamental sentencing principles that the proportionate, equitable, and that the offender is paid their debt to society. That's what we're hoping for. They learned their lesson. They're not going to reoffend. The victim's been made whole. And somebody that committed the same violation somewhere else got a similar sentence. Okay. Uh, how are we doing? So far to today, as far as proportionality, equity, and social debt, we're making strides, but a lot of room for improvement. Uh, that's pretty much what I told you about proportionality and equity. Federal sentencing is a joke. I don't even know why I left that up there. It's a table. It's a table. And they don't sentence by years, like two, three, or four years. They sentence by months. Right. Two months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, 152 months. Put your calculators out. How many years am I doing? What's 152? I don't know. Okay, but they go by a schedule. So you committed an offense across the top. The schedule comes down this way. How many months? No, the offenses are this way. Okay, so you committed these violations. Then the schedule goes across how many months you're going to get. Then you come down, and wherever they intersect, Yay, that's your punishment. Then they mitigate. And then they aggravate. Mitigate. Well, first time offender. Well, let's bring him up a level. Uh, he's a um, solid citizen. He pays his taxes, owns property. Oh, we'll knock him down another notch. Now, instead of doing 152 months, he might be doing 96. Let's go the other way. That's mitigating. Okay, mitigating, we're doing less. Aggravating, we're making it worse. This isn't his first attempt, or hers. They're repeat offenders. They're a little bit more. 200 months. He used a weapon. He's a gang member. See how it just keeps getting worse. But the feds use this stupid table. If you're interested in it, go for it. I hate it. That's all you need to know about the feds. They're dumb. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court overruled an early case found that any fact required to increase a sentence must be found by a jury, not a judge. They said it was hearsay that the judge ruled on it. And it was a big deal. What was happening, the judges were aggravating the sentence without due process. You can't do that. He can mitigate, make it last, but he can't aggravate without the jury giving him that authority. So what they're saying is, if you want to aggravate it, the jury has to make that determination. And that's fair. And you don't want a judge just listening to things that haven't been proven, taking them into consideration, and making a punishment harsher. I wouldn't want that. Two cases, Supreme Court greatly expanded judicial discretion at the federal level, sentencing guidelines advisory rather than mandatory. The state, it's mandatory. They have the triad, two, three, four, that's it. There's no discussion. Well, you can aggravate it to four, mitigate it to two, but the expected term would be in the middle. Okay, well, the federal court says they don't have to abide by that. They're not as strict. So they can mitigate based on circumstance or aggravate, if the criteria is there. But in order to aggravate, remember, it has to be proven in the court, not the judge by himself or herself. Make sense? A lot of good information. Court found federal sentencing guidelines unconstitutionally forced judges 
increased sentence based on their own factual finding. It goes back to that court case we talked about. The judge was making a determination of fact okay, without argument from either side. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 can't do that. Plea bargaining. Who does not know what plea bargaining is? Show me. Okay, good. One. So if you raise your hand, half the class isn't sure. Thank you. I'm teasing you. Okay, so plea bargaining. You're found guilty. Before we back up, before you're found guilty, you're accused. You don't have a case. Your attorney's telling you, you know, we need to settle. Because the likelihood if we go to trial, we're going to lose. The defendant's sitting there adamant. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. And the attorney says, does it matter? It doesn't matter. Because the state has enough evidence against you. They can prove it to a jury. Does that sound like justice? No. Does it matter? I've talked to several DAs about this one issue. It doesn't matter if the defendant's guilty. It's what we can prove in court. That's what they believe. So now you've got this allegedly innocent client, and you're trying to persuade them to take the plea. Because if they go to court, they're going to be looking at a minimum of five years in a state prison. Whereas the DA is offering them maybe six months in county and a three-year probation. Just take the plea. What would you do? That reminds me of the movie Cuban Man. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a damn good movie. That's a great movie. So what are you? Put yourself in that defendant's shoes. Would you take the plea? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Take the plea? You're going to take the plea? Now, the court recognized that a lot of these defendants may not be guilty, but they're willing to plead guilty or no contest because of the offer being made. They don't want to gamble with their livelihood of doing five years. So they came up, and there's a case called West Plea. It's called the West Plea, where the defendant is only pleading guilty to take advantage of a plea bargain being offered by the district attorney's office. How in the hell is that OK? And it's happening every day in our state. People, just like you would, are admitting guilt to something you didn't do just so you're not found guilty of the crime and sentenced for a harsher time. How does that make sense? If somebody could tell me, awesome. I can't figure it out. Okay? That's where plea bargaining fails. Plea bargaining works because the court needs to hear so many cases. They don't have time to call juries and have full trials. So if this is a guilty client, and if they go to court and they're looking at five years, and the DA knows if they're guilty or not, and they know. So instead of offering the six months like they did for the person they weren't too sure about, they might tell them, you know what, you go ahead and take the plea. We'll give you two years in prison and five years in probation. They're not going to give them a sweet deal. So this guy just may take the plea. And you know what, I know I'm guilty anyway. Might as well go ahead and take the offer. I've had clients flat out tell me that, that as soon as they get a good plea, they'll take it. They know they're not going to go to trial. Plea bargaining. Pros and cons. Yeah. If you plead no contest, is that like plead a felony on your record, or what, what does that do? Yeah, you're pleading guilty. But the no contest, good question. You go in a criminal court. You've done something to hurt somebody, right? So you're here to defend yourself or to be found guilty. Anything you say and do in this criminal court can be used against you in a civil proceeding by the victim. But if you plead no contest, that protects you in civil proceedings where you're not admitting guilt, so they can't use that against you. Whereas if you say, yeah, I'm guilty, boom, you just hung yourself. 
because now whoever you hurt is going to file a civil case against you and look, he even pled guilty during the criminal case. So that's one of the advantages. Okay, so plea bargaining, good and bad. You notice we've talked about what the DA's role is, what the defense attorney, what the accused. Remember, this is criminal. So if this is criminal, somebody got hurt. There's a victim. What happened to the victim in this negotiation? Did they get a voice? Another reason I don't like it. The victim has no say in the plea. And that was that book that you watched the one I spoke about? That book, Plea Bargaining? Russell Crowe's in it. Oh, the, good, uh, the Good Samaritan? No, uh, Law Abiding Citizen. Law Abiding Citizen, that's it. Law Abiding Citizen. Law Abiding Citizen, it's an excellent movie, but it does a good job of showing the downfalls of plea bargaining. Okay? Questions about plea bargaining? The four most traditional sanctions, imprisonment, probation, fines, and death. That's one hell of a sanction right there. I'm gonna kill you. You're dead. That penalty is reserved for the most heinous crime. We don't use it enough, but it's there. And then creative sentencing. Uh, maybe we'll give you some probation, uh, maybe pay fines, maybe lock you up on weekends. Stuff like that, yeah, they get creative with it. So it doesn't have to be just one, unless it's set, then you only get one. But the other is that could be a combination. Uh, probation is a sentence of imprisonment, and it can be suspended. And I like doing that. I do like suspending sentences. It, it's like dangling a threat, maybe? So for now, I'm going to give you two years counting. But I'm going to suspend those two years. As long as you don't commit an offense, you don't drink any alcohol, you attend your AA meeting, I start setting the guidelines. And so I give them the incentive. You don't want to go to jail. You've got to do these things. It works. It really does. Uh, often condition probation used to restore the offender to the community. They're working. I want them to keep their job. They have a family. I want them to continue to support that family. Because if I lock him up, I disrupt this other person's business, I disrupted the family, now I, got, and I as citizens, have to support this family. Welfare, unemployment, whatever the hell else program. It's more of a strain on the community if we lock them up. But if I can get them to go back and keep doing what they're doing, we all win. Okay. Number of active sentences handed out felons may seem low to some. Let's see, when viewed historically, statistics from the Port of Prison Commitments have increased nearly eightfold, eight times in the last 30 years. Why? Why has punishment gone up eight times in the last 30 years? It's going to happen next year. Politicians. Listen to their speeches when they get up on their soapboxes. Vote for me on Tough on Crime. Tough on Crime. What have you done so far? I will. They're the best at avoiding answering questions. Just listen to what they're saying. Uh, less traditional sentencing options. Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual, both statutory administrative law limit the uh, imprisonment or punishment that can be imposed. We cannot put someone in the, what they call it, stock, stock, where they put their arms and heads in it. The stocking. Stock, what's it called? Stocking range. Stocking's in front of your feet, man. Stock, it stocks something, right? They put them in there, and the kids can throw back their tomatoes at them. I'd love to see that come back. Yeah. Really? Embarrass them, humiliate them. Uh, put the letter A for adultery. <laughs> so if you, oh, you did that. Hey, okay, maybe it'll work out. So for the cruel and unusual punishment, does it can it be cruel but not unusual? Sure. Or, okay. So it's, it's, yeah, it can be both. But if it's not unusual, it's probably already been done and outlawed. So if you think about it, if it's not unusual, then maybe I've got rid of it. But I, I don't mind. 
It's humiliating. It should be. You're out there hurting kids. Some states have habitual offender laws, hate crimes, and so on. Hate crimes are wrong. They should be treated harshly. That, that's ugly. You hate a, group, a whole culture or a whole group of people just because of what God they worship, the color of their skin, sexual orientation. How does that make sense? Capital punishment. We're going to finish right now. 35 people were executed in 2014. I don't have a current statistic. It is just too sad. We don't use it enough. Whether or not you believe in the capital punishment, it works. It works. Only one person's ever died and came back. Only one. These others, you kill them, take them out of their misery, we're done with them, they ain't coming back. What did they do with the guy who died and came back? Oh, Jesus, man. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, we wrote a book about it. <laughs> okay, that's all I got for you guys. Uh, we will meet in class next week to start going over finals and entering your questions. Have a good weekend.